I won. Oh, that's good. Um, so. Okay, so welcome everyone back to our second talk today. Uh, our speaker is Matita Lanini, who is stuck in Rome, and she will talk about attractive forests and Taurus actions with a very nice first slide. The stage is all yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much to the organizers. Um, so maybe I have to apologize because I uh, missed some talks. That's because of my teaching schedule. So I'm sorry. Um, so okay, what I am going to talk about today is this attractive forest and Taurus action. So, um, this color really works actually only in Italian or maybe Spanish because so Tori, Tori means bulls but somehow whenever I, I i give this as soon as i get the title i this image flashed in my mind and i hope uh, maybe it's going to help you to remember what i'm going to talk about so it's about ucs forest that's good so forest um it's um going to be a nice uh quiver rep quiver representation and then what we want to do so that there there's a certain class of varieties we can uh, construct from that and then we want to keep that with Taurus action. And we're going to see that there's going to be a lot of Tauri acting, so that smaller and bigger, as you can see from the cover. So meaning that like a smaller or bigger rank. Okay. So that's, um, that's what we are going to be talking about. So everything I'm going to say is a joint work with uh, Alex Putz, postdoc in Rome. And, um, so maybe some of you attended a, um, a first version of this talk it was about the first part of the project um, where I was um, not talking about forests but about um, equi-oriented cycles. So we, we, we went a bit farther this time. So first of all, what's the goal? So, um, so first let me tell you the short term goal. So the goal is, um, to allow me to play my favorite game, which is um, sort of being able to play mom and apply mom and graph techniques. So maybe uh, more formally, what I'm, uh, what we want to do is to equip, um, as I said, certain uh, variety. Let me just write already their name. So appropriate quiver Grossmannian. Um, with nice Taurus actions. All right, so, um, so maybe let me spend some words. So if you know me, you know already what I mean by that. Uh, you know already why I like it very much or what sort of game I wanna play it. But uh, if not, uh, and I always like it to, to rewind it. So I, I get always excited. So, okay. So let's see, so we start with a complex projective algebraic variety X, and we have a torus acting on it. Now, if the action is nice, and I'll tell you what for me nice means, but anyway, if it's nice enough, what one can do is that one can look a local data and derive global information about X. So what do I mean by that? So for example, um, so if we have a small torus, so let's say rank one, so we have a C star acting. So if we have a C star acting and we have a finite number of fixed points, then this gives us the, so we count them, and then we magically have the other characteristic of the variety. Or if the um, action is, Let's say X is smooth, for example, the, we have again a C star. What we get is a BB decomposition. So we have a cell um, decomposition of X. And by counting the number of cells um, of any given dimension, we can um, deduce the Betty numbers of X. So I want more, though. I want a bigger torus. And so if I have a bigger, nice torus, what I can get is even, um, oh, I have um, um, a way of deducing for local data information about the cohomology ring. So for example, 
So if x is even smooth, we can, um, which is not what I'm going to have in general, so we can even compute all um, um, generalized cohomology theories. If x has a weakness stratification, which is t-stable, we can even compute intersection, equivariant intersection cohomology. Even cohomology here is actually a t-stable equivariant, but that you can recover the cohomologies. So let me um, explain what nice means. So for me, nice means uh, the following. So X and T are nice, otherwise said are a GKM pair, F. So the first thing I asked for is um, actually is a niceness, niceness property of X. So I want all um, cohomology groups to vanish unless I is even. And then, um, and then, okay, that's about X, but T is acting on it. So I want that the number of six points and a one dimensional T orbit is finite. Okay. So the first I could get rid of, of this assumption, and then, but, but for today, it's a good one. Very nice. So DKM uh, comes from Goretsky convex McPherson, and it is because what I'm going to recall in a few minutes, it's um, a version of them of the localization theorem. Okay. Um, a very famous paper from 1998. So, so why do we like, uh, why do I say nice? So well, from now on, let's say we have a GMK pair, and so we have a fact, we said we chose um, so the following. So if X T is a GKM pair and I pick whatever one dimensional orbit, so I recall that for me X is a complex projective algebraic variety. So if I close it up, this is just isomorphic to a P1 because it's a sphere, so which consists hence of two fixed points, which I've added from a one-dimensional orbit. Well, so of course, now O is, um, is nothing but a one-dimensional representation of T, okay, on my torus. So meaning that the torus, so it's rotating this sphere, and the speed, so the way it acts, is a torus character. Okay, so T acts on my orbit via some torus character alpha, So, and this alpha, in fact, is uniquely determined after a sign. So this depends which one between x and y is going to be zero and which one is infinity. So what is the origin of which, which atlas you pick for your P1. Anyway, alpha is uniquely determined after a sign. And we pick, so we choose one, one alpha, which then I denote alpha O for any orbit. So, and as I said, I, I stress it, I want to um, yes, say it once again. So it is uniquely determined after a sign and nothing, um, so the sign is not going to play any role in what I'm going to say. So, okay, so what, what we have hence is that when, whenever I have a one dimensional orbit, it has two fixed points in its closure. So, meaning that again, under the assumption that XT is a GKM pair, I have a graph. If I look, at the one skeleton of, of this section. Okay, that's called moment graph. And it has a set of vertices, the fixed point set. And then as add, we have the one dimensional orbit, orbit closures. And then I want to call everything by the corresponding torus character. Okay, so let me call it or maybe alpha. So alpha is a function from E to the character lattice, which sends O to alpha O as above. Okay. So I, I, I have, if I have again a GKM pair, I can and associate to um, the torus action graph. Okay. So example, 
So, um, example is um, the um, as an X. My variety is the variety of complete flags in CN plus one, so FLN plus one. It is acted upon an N plus one dimensional torus, which I identify with a diagonal invertible matrices. Um, well, and now, so the fixed point sets, so the vertex sets on my um, torus is just the one to one correspondence with the symmetric group. And I have a, an edge, if and only if my two permutations are related by a transposition ij. And now, whenever I have an edge like sigma, I j sigma, the torus character, I label it by is this one. Okay. And here I see again the fact that uh, it's, it's uniquely determined of first time because I have to decide uh, which one is, for example, smaller. I decide that I pick I less than j, okay. But of course, um, I mean, the transposition ij is the same as the transposition ji. So it's a uniquely determinant. Okay, and so here you have an example in the case of n equals three. So it's a quite right of FL3. All right, so well, this is a very, very, very well-known example. And now uh, you know how that is very interesting and then nice, I mean, it's interesting from, very many um, viewpoints, even from the combinatorial point of view. And so, and it's also a very special case because you can just uh, do the same with any reductive group, uh, quotient by some parabolic, and then looking at the action of the maximum torus. So, particularly, you're always going to get what's called the blue hat graph. Okay, so, so I told you what. Um, we want to do is to um, say something about cohomology. So we actually, since we have a torus acting, we are going to work in the equivariant setting. So I'll define by R the T equivariant cohomology of a point. Okay, so that's uh, just a polynomial ring, which has a um, number of variables, just the rank along a torus. And um, so of course, we have an injection of the fixed point set inside X. And then equivalent cohomology is factorial. So we can look at the pull back of this uh, inclusion morphism. So now we remember that, um, so, so we, are, we again have a GKM pair. So that's always like that in our, at least in this section. And, um, and so by, by, by definition, the number of fixed points is finite. So in particular, they are isolated. And so this is just isomorphic to, um, well, number of fixed points times this polynomial ring. So in Goreski convex McPherson version of, um, the localization theorem says that um, the so I star is an injective map. Well, let me say of S algebras R, R sorry. I'm trying to use R because R is the one uh, usually is Zerg bimodule people use. So it's an injective map of R algebras. And um, and its image is isomorphic to the following. So as a set, we have um, tuples of polynomials, one uh, for any fixed point, and then they're such that they are compatible with respect to the labels we have on the edges of our graph 
whenever we have an edge among the fixed points. So Fx and Fy are elements in R. Also alpha O is an element there. And so I want them to be the same modulo alpha O if X and Y are the two fixed points I'm adding to close up my, my orbit. So it has a structure of, of an algebra under component-wise addition and multiplication and diagonal action of R. So this, um, we get somehow I nice a description of, um, of the equivalent cohomology. You can recover the cohomology just tensoring over, here we have a Q, a Q so over R by Q. Okay, so in fact, so in the, um, in the good cases, so for example, in the case of flat varieties, this is true even over Z. Okay, so you don't, um, you can just work over Z, you don't need to, to extend um, scalars. Um, so let me say um, another two words about, um, so why one should like it. So well, uh, there are a lot of, so this algebra appeared um, everywhere, somehow, at least in the case of uh, flat varieties. So it is in fact just the quinvariant ring. So it is isomorphic to the quinvariant ring. So, so well, uh, so we could say this way since we've heard a lot about the Rugby modules. So um, one thing you can do is that you can consider a certain category of modules over this algebra, and then you get an, an, an equivalent realization of the categories over by modules. So another thing, so if we think about our example upstairs, so we have FLN plus one, then uh, the ring downstairs, so this algebra is isomorphic to the um, to the center of an equivariant principal block of category O for SLN plus one C. And this is uh, in fact true in general. If you um, take any other, let me talk about finite dimensional, but also cuts moody on no critical level, um, the algebra. Also, um, so it's really like, so sugar calculus people really like to have this uh, description of the cohomology. Because, um, well, because it allows you, for example, to describe equivalent sugar classes in a, in a very explicit way. And so you can play, um, yeah, you have a nice basis and for the um, cohomology of flag varieties. And, um, um, and then another thing, and then I, I, I promise I'm going to keep going, um, is that you can, for example, again, in the case of a flag variety, you can explicitly realize by group actions on this algebra. So you just see that you, you permute the entries and maybe you twist the action, do you twist the R action and you get left and right action of the algebra. So, so what we're going to do today um, is um, we want to describe, so we want to keep uh, quiver Grassmannians with a torus action in such a way that we're gonna get plenty of examples of GKM varieties. The Mormon graph, um, it's going to have a nice combinatorial description, which is good because somehow if you know that something is a GKM pair, but you don't have a combinatorial description, you, you haven't gotten anything somehow good. Because that's exactly the point. If you, if you can play with the graph, then you have really a combinatorial description. And um, yeah, so that's what we're going to do. So, well, then at this point, um, I, of course, I, I, I spent more time than what I wanted on this exciting part. And now I need to, to, to tell you some quiver background. So let me say background on quivers. So background on quivers. So we, we, so quiver is just an oriented graph. So Q0 is going to be for me the set of vertices and Q1 um, is the set of oriented. Edges. So that's a quiver. So we want to deal with a quiver representation. So a quiver representation over some field K. Well, um, at some it appears already in Monica's talk. So one way of seeing this, so she was talking about uh, representation of a category 
then you can think of the category associated to the fever and then that's the same. So, but like, it's really nothing but uh, a collection of k vector spaces. So for any i in uh, q0. And then, so, so for any edge, you're going to have a k linear map. So, so here we have, let's say, an edge A from I to J. So here we're going to have our vector space M I, M J, and M A is a linear map among them. So that's a QRF. So let me um, make a boring example, but it's um, going to show up afterwards so that I can set some notation. So whenever I have a quiver, I can um, um, define the boring representation VQ, which is um, so over K. So I just have a one dimensional vector space for, na for any um, vertex. And then um, for any edge, I just have the identity map. Okay. That's going on. It's a bit boring, but it's going to be useful. <laughs> So well, of course, um, so you can make sense of a notion of morphisms of q maps. That means you just have morphisms among, uh, between the, the various vector spaces, MIs, which commutes with the k-linear maps, you see? And so you get the category of q representations with k coefficients. And, um, but I only wanted to consider the finite dimensional one. So my starting point um, was a forest, and I had told you that a forest is a, is a nicely behaved representation. I'm still going to need some time to define it, but I also told you that the main point was that I want you to deal with certain class of varieties, which I am associated. To any with any mm, representation of Q. So before the break, I'm going to give you a definition of that. So when I pick a representation of a quiver and then a tuple EI of non-negative numbers, one for any uh, uh, vertex. So which is and then I want to tell you what the uh, corresponding quiver Grassmannian is. Well, this is nothing but the um, set of set. It's just the set of sub -rep. You It's a sub-representation of M, so it's just a sub-object in this category. And now whose um, vector spaces have a prescribed dimension. So this is um, clearly contained in the product of Grassmannians in the classical sense. Okay, so here EIMI just means the Grassmannian of EI dimensional subspaces of the vector space MI. Again, where I is in um, in 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 in, in um, Q zero. And then and the, 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 the property of being a subrep is in fact closed. Okay. So this gives in fact a degree M with a structure of a projective algebraic variety. Which is um, in general singular and also not normal. So maybe let me um, give you an example, 24, and then um, we can have a break. Okay. So maybe um, first, so yeah, let me give an example and then um, maybe I say one word before the example that is, um, well, in fact, uh, by result of Marcus Reiner, for every um, algebra, projective algebraic variety can be realized this way which is somehow it means that one cannot really hope to deal with the whole uh, possible quiver Grassmannians. Um, 
And um, but still, it means that it's a very rich class of variety, right? So it's everything we can hope for. So um, an example of the value that we recover. So which 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 we want. So let let us look at the A type A and thinking quiver. Okay. So now I can consider the following representation. I could also actually I could put K. Now I, I will since afterwards I want to deal with complex varieties, I just put T. And then um, the errors, I just pick the identity maps. Well then if I take as E one to N minus one N then the corresponding quiver Grassmannian, it just isomorphic to FLN plus one. Okay. So, I mean, this is just to, to say that this is going to be, of course, one example, of course. And, uh, and the torus section we are going to, to define recovers the, the classical one. So, in some sense, um, I was very satisfied and pleased with that, meaning that we are really extending this beautiful thing. So, maybe I would take a break. Now, 26. Yep. Thank you very much. You. Please feel free to ask questions. Sorry, Martin, I'm a bit confused. Yeah. The edge is you you when you fix your representation yeah. m yeah um so it has some fixed more some fixed maps along the edges yeah so you need to somehow require that um you that is, the, yeah that the source of each map is cont actually contained in the image of the next map it, the source of each map is contained that you choose your UIs on the vertices so that the yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, is that that's somehow part of the sub representation okay yeah. all right yeah yeah Great. yeah Thank I should I was sort of being lazy so that's why I was normally yeah yeah we have a category I pick a sub object yeah if, I mean you can just explicitly okay. say I have a collection of vector spaces such that whenever I apply the map so let's say like here I have UI and UJ. And then I, will, I want MA of UI to be contained in Yeah, UJ. okay, all right. So that's exactly um, what um, the sub-object is, yeah. And Martina, you mentioned the result by uh, Markus Reinecke about what, what are the precise assumptions? And he shows that every projective, complex projective variety arises in this way? Yeah, yes, and that's crazy, yeah? But I mean, the point is that if, if you say this way, it, it seems like an extremely powerful thing. But the point is that when, when you construct the quiver, you get horrible quivers. So in, in that sense, um, um, so he, for example, it's a very short paper. So it doesn't, it didn't start to construct him. So it doesn't give you, let me say, the best quiver or the easiest quiver you can deal with. So it's not the optimal way to realize the variety in some sense. So you can but get very complicated quivers, but in principle, you can realize every complex projective of the variety. But in principle, his proof is constructive. And if you went through the proof, you could. Yeah. Yes. OK. Well, oh, that's amazing. Can you give us a ref? Like, what, what's the name of the paper? I, I think it's, uh, let me see. Well, you can send me afterwards. Don't worry. I mean, if you don't find right now. Maybe you, Alex, are you there? Yeah, it's called Every Projective Variety is a Quiver Gross Money. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, but doesn't it make sense conceptually if I choose a chart, a chart, a patching, then I can put one vertex in the quiver for each patching and one edge for each overlap and then build, um, build the equations from one. Really yeah, it's it's more that. or less the, the, the way it goes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's why I mean you, you can get very complicated 
privacy principle. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so I, I've put Marco's paper in the in the chat. Oh, thanks. His paper, and if there are no other questions, just feel free to continue. Okay. So now we go to the tree part. So we're going to talk about trees and forests. So um, so okay. Let me first say what a. a, a tree quiver. So a tree um, is a finite quiver, meaning has a finite number of edges and, and, and vertices. Let me call it S because T was the torus. Um, so has underlying rough, so meaning I forget about the orientation of the edges, is a tree. That means it's simply connected. So, okay. So that's what a, what a, what a tree is. So I'm just uh, picking a tree and then uh, deciding whatever orientation I like. I get in a quiver and then I call it tree. So uh, now in general, so now I want to tell you what a tree rep is. And the, the big idea is this, is that um, I'm going to have my quiver and then I'm going to have a rough morphism between a tree and the quiver. And this by pulling, pushing forward the, um, the, the, the boring representation on a tree, I'm going to get the tree representation on the, on the quiver. Let me formalize this. So let's pick F from S to Q. This is an oriented graph morphism. Okay, so it's uh, standing um, vertices to vertices in a compatible way with the orientation of the edges. And uh, where S is a tree. And now we say that um, it's a winding if um, whenever I have in S a configuration like this or like this, then FA is different from FB. Somehow, if I have two adjacent edges to the uh, two adjacent uh, vertices to the same uh, edges to the same vertex, which are either going out or getting in both, I don't want them to be sent to the same guy downstairs. And so now, uh, in general, I have, um, as I was saying, a um, push down uh, functor from the uh, representation category of S to the representation category of Q. Okay. And this is somehow just obtained by looking at a pre-image of what I have on any vertex and on any edge. Okay, so for example, let me just write what I get for, for the vertices. So here am I, it's not just going to be the direct sum of the R, the um, K, not K is the field, V, 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 U, where uh, U is in F minus one of I. And, and the same with the, with the edges. So another representation M of Q is said to be a tree, well, actually a tree representation if there exists there exist a tree, S, and a winding, F from S to M uh, such that when I push down the um, boring wrap of S, I remember the boring wrap was just to have uh, the field, there's a one dimensional vector space on any uh, vertex and the identity maps among them. And um, it's isomorphic to M. 
that's the three. So the idea is that you are, so for example, graphically, let us imagine that our Q, for example, is a loop. Okay. And then our S is just some, I don't know, A4. Okay. And so what's happening is that I'm sort of looping this around. So I'm sending I here have no many choices. So it's sending all um, vertices to the, the unique vertex and all edges to the unique edge. And so I should imagine this this way. And so we just okay. that's by winding. So now in fact, which is actually easy to get convinced by, is that um, three representations are um, in the composable. So now I'm ready to say what a forest is. So well, in um, RFKQ, RFKQ is a Kruschmidt category. So we can write everything as a direct sum of in the composable objects. And now I'll say that a representation of Q is a forest if um, it's in the composable summons are all trees. Well, three representations. So well, whenever um, Whenever we have a, whenever Q itself is a tree, so you don't need to, to do any winding in principle. So for example, if we take, if we take the boring wrap of AN, maybe N plus one times, this is a forest. And so that was the same as the, the representations we were considering earlier to get the, the flag variety. S sorry, Martina, can yeah. I ask, um, sure. in your definition of tree representation, what is a VS again? Oh, VS was the boring guy. So VS means that, um, so S is a tree, so it's a, it's a quiver. So I, I look, I consider the representation of that quiver having on any vertex a K, so I copy out the field. And then um, whenever I have an edge, it's just the identity morphism. Okay. Yeah. So here, for example, would be just C, 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 C. Okay. And then the identity is always like this. Okay. So we're just saying, I was noticing that the, the representation we had before with all this CN plus one is just a direct sum of N plus one, three, representations. So it's a forest. That was the only observation. All right, so now, so what, um, so we, we got to the, the fun part, which is um, torus actions. So what we, um, again, so our goal is to define a torus action on the EM, where M is a forest. And so our T is actually going to be isomorphic to, let me write D plus C copies of C star, where D is something I have no freedom about because it's the number of trees in the forest. So, which also means is the number of indecomposable summons of n. And C, I have complete freedom apart from being at least zero. So it's something I pick and we call it complexity parameter. So, now, um, so, so the way we're going to define the action is um, first of all, what I'm going to do for you, and it's going to be a little Technical, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So first um, we're going to, to define an action of T 
on the underlying vector space. So this is the direct sum of all vector spaces um, which were um, part of the data of the representation. And then there's going to be a lemma which will tell us that this action extends to induces an action on the field of the sum, which is, so maybe I'll say it now, since then it's going to be, again, a little bit more technical. I want you to, to listen to me. So, um, so it is, in fact, T is not going to act by uh, um, automorphisms in the category of Q representations. But um, so it's not clear a priori that is, it can be lifted to um, an, an action on the quiver Grassmannian, and you have to, to, to check it. So, um, so, okay. So we want to define this action. And actually, we, what we're going to do is that so we, we want to fix B, which is a basis of this vector space. So in particular, it's going to be the union of BI. So that's uh, fixed once and for all, and bi in mi subbasis. And so what what I'm what we're going to do is to say how a porous element acts on one element of the basis and an expanded linearity. So in order to do that, we need a combinatorial gadget, which one can associate with any um, a quiver representation and basis of it, which is another quiver, which is called coefficient quiver. And um, so it's, um, it's set of vertices is the basis, the, the, the chosen basis itself. And then the set of edges. Well, um, so we have two elements of our basis. And now we have an edge among them. Well, if and only if. Well, I mean, there are elements of the basis, so they will belong to some bi and bj. Okay. And then, um, so one that i and j are uh, related, so are connected in my fever. And then I also want that whenever so B, little b is an element of bi, so I can apply to it ma. Then mab is an element of bj, so I can just um, write it, express it in terms of elements of bj um, with some coefficients, and I want the, um, the coefficient of b prime is non zero. So these are two basis elements, and then just say that if I apply the map uh, given to me by, by the representation M, and I express uh, the, the image in terms of the elements in BJ, well, B prime is going to appear in this expression. Then here, I notice right away that I get a map from the set of edges of this new quiver to the set of edges of my quiver, which I call it pi. Now there are several things. Well, first of all, I can um, always pick a basis such that when I look, so I have a graph now, which comes from the, 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 this choice I made of a basis B, and I could choose one in such a way that the connected components of this graph are in, um, in are, the connected components corresponds to the composable summons. That's somehow clear, you just write the basis. Um, so such that the connected components Uh, um, um, correspond correspond to the in the composable summons of um, M. Well, in fact, each one of these connected components is itself a tree. So 
I'm going to use this to, to define my action. So you should imagine that what you have, so we have our quiver, which is given to us. We have a representation, which is given to us. We pick a basis. And now, well, now I observe that, um, so by what I said, any element of the basis, well, of course, it's going to, to correspond to a unique tree in the coefficient quiver. And that's going to help me in defining the action. So let me, let me see. Okay, so what I want to do now is that I pick, so remember our torus was um, D plus C, where D was the number of trees. And so now an element in T, I want to write it this way. So I, I separate the D, first D entries with the, third, with the C entries. Um, so here I call something gamma S, where S is one of the three. So which means in the composable summons. And then C is my C that I picked. So I call it new, the entries corresponding to this. And J here varies from one to C. So as I said, I want to tell you how gamma, such a gamma act, what, what, what its effect is on B, where B is a basis, basis element. So as I said, B, um, there exists a unique tree in um, um, Q and B with a B in S. And, um, and then I'm going to have, so what's going to happen is that gamma is just going to rescale B by something. Okay. And so this something, so the first uh, D copies of C star, where they just rescale B by gamma S. Okay. So that's the entry corresponding to the tree to which B belong, belongs. And then um, new J's, um, I'm deciding how much I want to say. Let me let me try to say something. I hope I'm um, yeah. Let's see how it goes. So these um, new eyes, they will. So the way this second part of the torus acts is going to depend on several choices. So um, so what we have to do is that we have to choose a, a subset of the set of edges. And we have to choose a partition on it of it into C parts. And then also we have to choose um, once and for all, we have to choose um, a vertex for any tree. Let me write a terminal vertex. That's um, a recipe to pick it, which I'm not going to um, describe. So a terminal vertex, BS for any tree. So once we have this, so let's see. So again, so we have our representation. We have some graph including it, giving us information about the representation we have and the basis. So now I pick one basis element I, I look for it, I find it in my coefficient quiver, and this is just going to lie on one, on one tree. And there is, since it's a tree, there is a unique path from BS to this guy, if I forget about the orientation of the edges. Okay. So remember a tree in terms of quiver is a, is a tree to which I've, I've given an orientation to the edges. But then if I forget about it, I find a path, a unique path, which relates B to B, B S to B. Okay, so, so now for any B, so B is fixed. And now let me say for any J, from one to C, I get to define my W J B, which depends on the, as I said, on the position, on the relative position of B with respect to B S on the given tree. So I'm just gonna write something, a formula, and maybe, so here, 
So for my chosen B, also there exists a unique path um, um, on the underlying graph to S, um, which is going to be something like A R bar, A one bar, where bar means I'm uh, forgetting the orientation. And, um, and so this is just the number of i such that pi of a r bar is in q prime one j. And I'll, I'll say two words. Otherwise, um, you just believe me uh, that this is somehow a recipe, a formula which comes from exactly what I said. So you look at this graph and you see where your B is and you can cook up a number, okay? So, so again, you're just somehow waiting the, the, the vertices, waiting the edges you, you walk on by one or minus one, depending on whether you're taking the right orientation or the wrong one. And whether they're contained or not in the part you picked or the subset of vertices. Anyway, there's a combinatorial recipe which allows you to define this action. So here you have W1B, WC, WCB. So, and, uh, so this, in fact, gives uh, then you extend it by linearity, and this gives us the desired action. The dilemma is that this action lifts the above action lifts to um, a T action on little e. Um, okay. All right. So let me conclude. Have what, three minutes. Attractive forests and main result slash conjecture. So definition um, is an attractive forest. So forest M in rep C Q. Is a um, let me write this T attractive where T again is C star B plus C if there exists a subset of Q one and the partition Q one one. Q1C of it, such that, well, morally, what happens is that on any tree of Q and B, and if I look at any all um, the vertices of Q0, well, the corresponding weights, which I've defined for you before, so we can look at them as a couple, when B varies in BI as zero? Well, these are all distinct. Well, this is somehow a technical um, condition to get um, the, um, the following result. That is that if a forest is T attractive, then it has a cellular decomposition, which is important for us because some of this, this allows us to I mean, to prove that the cohomology vanishes in odd degrees, okay? Anyway, so the attractive forest is a forest in which our torus act in a nice way. And I do theorem, um, let me write first this a version and then I'll, I'll, I'll modify it a little bit. So that's um, um, a preprint we have with Alex, um, which is in a special case in which 
M, so this is a special forest. M is an important representation of the equivalent cycle of delta N. So this is the cycle. Then um, we have that rho E M T is a DKM pair. And two, the corresponding moment graph um, admits a um, nice, well, an explicit, nice, an explicit uh, combinatorial description in terms of the coefficient quiver. And then, um, so this is conjecture or theorem 21. So I mean, it's, um, let me say 99% proven, but um, I don't want, I mean, we haven't checked, um, every single detail. So I, I, don't, I want to say it this way, is that same as before for um, M, whatever, a traffic forest. Right. So, and as I said, so there's plenty of examples. So the all, I mean, even for the Nilpata representations of Delta N, we have, uh, I mean, you can, not only the flag varieties, there's a big family of, degenerations, linear degenerations of flag varieties, which can be realized this way. There are finite dimensional approximation of GLN affine Grasmanian and GLN affine flag variety. And, the, and a lot of, um, it's a very rich geometry, even just for, in the first case, but somehow attractive for is, um, broad, I mean, broadens the, 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 the the family of, of, of GKM variety with um, a good, Combinatorial description of the moment graph. Um, very much. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a little over time. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Thank you very much, Martina. So now is the time for questions. So go feel free to ask questions. Can you, oh, can you say a few words about like in what kind of what kind of flavor is that combinatorial description that yeah. you get in terms of the coefficient? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 I mean, one, yes, I even have an example. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it wasn't prepared, I promise you. So, Tariq, you didn't know. Um, so, I mean, that's a very basic example. So, it's a, a two, so you, you don't need to have forest and so on. But somehow, so fixed points are, well, somehow it's exactly as for flag variety. So you look at coordinate um, representations in the sense that here, so the representation you can read off from the coefficient quiver. So here you have, um, so it's a direct sum of like this uh, extremely boring guys, it's just K on the first vertex and K in the second one. And here, this was, um, I would have called it before VA2. Okay, so it's KK identity, KK identity. So here, if you pick, so here the dimension vector is one, two in the example downstairs. So what you have to do is to pick one, um, one vertex on the first column and then pick what are called all the vertices which are related to them. So these are configurations which are called successor close. So meaning whenever you, you want a thing, then you have the flow, the whole flow. So you have just to follow what you have. And then you do it according to, to the dimension. Um, so these are the fixed points. These are called successor closed um, set quivers. And then, um, so the edges that corresponds to, uh, here's maybe it's too small. So what you do is somehow you move up and down 
subtrees in such a way that again you get something which is a successor closed. So here, yeah, again, here it's a bit boring because the subtree is just uh, is one vertex. So I pick it here and I move it down. Here, a subtree is that I move this segment here and I move it here. Well, move meaning that I uh, highlight something else. And so, and, and here we're playing all this again. So you can do it always. So what you have, you, you're going to have a, so in general, you have a configuration of a lot of trees. And so you cut a piece of a tree in such a way that you still get a successor close configuration and you do it down, like in the same columns. So you're sliding things. And then you just read off the, the labels a little bit like for, for flag varieties. So depending on where you're moving, you're starting, so you're the root of the tree. Yeah. So it's really, so for the, yeah, for the flag variety, you just really see permutations. It, it, it's really it's just, just the same thing. So it's very happy. So yeah, you're just moving. So yeah, you saw the example of, of FLM plus one. So as soon as you pick one vertex, you have to take all the strings. And so it's really just permuting things. You cannot do, as soon as you move one vertex, you have to move the whole string. And so it, it means you're permuting and, and nothing more. In this example, can you say what, which are the coordinates of your torus? I don't understand delta. Oh, yes, sorry. I thought I, I had it here. No, okay. Yeah, the coordinates are, um, yeah, so somehow, oh, where is that? Yeah. So you have D is four, okay? And then you have, in this case, C is one. And so C corresponds to Delta. <laughs> so um, yeah, so you have, uh, yeah, I could have called it e Epsilon five. So E, I are the usual ones, okay? T five, T, T, I, if I goes from one to four is a, 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 a notation which is not it's very convenient. And then delta is just if you pick T5. Yeah. And so here, like going back to what we were saying before. So, so here, um, so what delta is doing, let me see where we see a delta. Yeah, so delta is doing something non-trivial between this guy and this guy. And this is because here, um, so intuitively he was, so th this, this thing is like the first position in the tree. So it's distance zero from the root and here is going to be distance one. And so he moved, so he, he gains one, one position in the tree and so he gets a delta. So here I would say, yeah, here is the same. Let's see another delta. And why is D4? Yeah. Why is D4 in this example? Oh, D4 because, yeah. So we have um, four in the composable summons. Which oh, are this great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Sorry, that was the, the, the question. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah, we're saying. So this is extremely boring, guys. So it's just a representation K on the first vertex and zero and K and zero. And then these are, these are the, re yeah, this actually, I didn't call them boring. So these are, yeah, it's a, it's a tiny tree. So it's a tree of only one, one, one vertex. And here these are longer boring guys. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, then I thank the speaker again. It was a very nice talk. Thank you all. I have a turn of the recording.